Good morning. The uh, Saints of Park Baptist Church send you greetings this morning. As Scott mentioned, my name is Grant. My wife Maria and I are moving this Friday back up to the Shenandoah Valley, uh, the promised land, God's country, Virginia. And uh, we are going to be taking part in a revitalization work there of my home church, the church that I trusted in the Lord Jesus at, the church that I preached my first sermon ever when I was just 16. I've probably preached five or 600 sermons since then. My first one was in that pulpit in Weirs Cave, Virginia at New Covenant Community Church. Um, saints like you said, Grant, we see this gifting in you. We see this way the Lord could use you. And they sort of fanned me into flame and sent me off. And that was about 10 years ago when I went away to Bible college. Since then, I've got my first master's, my second master's, my master's divinity, and I'm coming back to the Shenandoah Valley to love and pastor a people that loved and cared for me so well as I grew up. So thank you guys so much for your partnership, care, support for us as we go back uh, to do that work. I'm going to pray for us. We're going to jump right in. Uh, Father, we love you. We thank you for this morning. We pray not because we have to, but because we get to. Would you silence our hearts? Would you make our minds ever so focused on your text today, your word? Would you make sense of it to us? Lord, I pray that we would be like Nehemiah uh, chapter 8 when Ezra's reading the book of the law aloud and he reads it from morning to midday and he reads the text and explains the sense and the people worship. I pray that that would be the case this morning here at Northside Baptist Church in Rock Hill. Father, we give you all the praise and all the glory. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you have a copy of God's word, go ahead and open it with me to the book of Psalms. Psalms 139, we're going to be in Psalm 139 this morning. Psalm 139. If your marriage is anything like mine, you have your savers and you have your spenders. And I'll give you one guess at what I am, and no, it's not the saver, okay? There's a reason that I'm typically not allowed to go to grocery stores for our family, okay? I tend to improvise on the shopping list, okay? Instead of buying onions, you know, you might find a pack of Oreos in my, in my shopping cart, okay? It may not be fresh fruit. I might opt for cereal instead, but don't worry, it will be the fruity kind, Okay? So we make sacrifices here and there. Uh, one thing you'll notice, though, is when you go to grocery stores, if you go to the ones that I go to, you'll notice that grocery stores have sub-branding, meaning if you go to Walmart, what are you custom to see, right? You don't want to pay name brand stuff. You want to opt for great value, right? Because great value is just as good as the other stuff. Or, or maybe you're a bulk shopper. Maybe you go to Sam's Club and you get Members Mark, Sam's Club brand. Or if you're uh, a true disciple of the Lord Jesus, you go to Costco, uh, the promised land, and you get uh, Kirkland brand items, Costco. But it doesn't have to be grocery stores. Even clothing companies have adopted these kind of sub-brands in their larger brand. Uh, recently, a friend of mine was wearing a, a Columbia shirt. And uh, I noticed on the sleeve, it had the term Omni-Shade. And apparently, it's a technology that cools you down in the summer, Omni-Shade. So I was curious, I went online, I was like, I'm going to see if there's other Omni products. And so I go and I find Omni Heat. Okay, Omni Heat is bulky, breathable jackets that you wear in the wintertime. And it keeps you warm, but it also doesn't suffocate you. Omni Heat. They also have Omni Flex. Didn't know this. It's a rain jacket material that's, again, breathable. Allows you to go out in the rain and not worry about overheating in some rain jackets that you might own. And then there's Omni Max. Omni Max are, are shoes. They're breathable footwear. And Omni literally translates to mean all. Uh, Columbia is essentially saying, we're going to be your one-stop shop for all of your clothing, jacket, and footwear needs. Now, friends, this morning in the text, we're going to witness and adore the Omni God. In this psalm, David will sing for us, four reasons why we are able to trust and adore God. Namely, I'm going to give you my outline right from the start. Okay, I'm type A. I don't know if you are. If you're not, it's okay. I'm giving you this for free. Okay, it's free this morning. We can trust God because, one, he is omniscient. 
He is omnipresent. He is omnipotent. And lastly, he is one you probably haven't heard, omnicompetent. Uh, This text is a psalm of trust. And in these 24 verses, we don't even need to look for an outline. David has conveniently given us an outline as he writes this psalm to us. The first six verses make a stanza. The next six verses make a stanza. The next six verses make a stanza, ending in 24 verses, four stanzas of six. The first of four stanzas that I want to show you in this text is this. That we can trust God because he is omniscient. He is omniscient. In other words, friends, he knows everything. He's omniscient. He knows everything. Look with me in your text, Psalm 139. We're going to read verses 1 through 6. Here's what David writes. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, behold, Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I, I, I cannot attain it. David exposes in these first six verses with striking clarity the Lord's omniscience of our whole lives. But specifically in verse 1, we see that the Lord knows David's heart. The Lord knows David's heart. Friend, the Lord has a penetrating, precise knowledge of your heart and my heart this morning. Like an x-ray machine, your life and your heart are laid bare before him. There isn't a detail he misses. There isn't a thing he sees in your heart. The Lord knows also your character. If you ever grew up in elementary school, walking the hallways of elementary or middle or high school, and you see that character is who you are when no one's looking. Well, guess what, friends? God is always looking. And while you may be able to hide your character from some, those that know you best may know it better, but God knows it perfectly. He knows it intimately. Friend, God knows the inclinations of your heart. He knows what you're hot after. He knows what gets you up in the morning. He knows what drives you. He knows what fuels you. God knows your heart intimately. But it isn't just your heart. In verses 2 to 3, we see that the Lord knows David's actions. So if you're worried about the Lord knowing who you are, He also knows what you've done. Nothing is hidden from him. All that you've done is known. Everywhere that you've gone, everything that you've picked up, everything that you've put down, the Lord doesn't just know your character, in other words. He knows your conduct. And in verse 4, we see that the Lord knows David's words. Beloved, nothing that you've ever said is hidden from God. Nothing you've ever said. And we aren't just talking about curse words. We're talking about every foolish thing that you've ever whispered to a friend that you whispered because you didn't want anybody else to hear you. Every crude joke, every uh, corrupt, crass speech that's uttered from your lips. And what about lies? Well, friend, those are known too by God. Even the little white ones. Every rumor you've spread, every gossip that you've perpetuated about another, he knows them all. Consider what Solomon pens in Proverbs 12. It's not on the screen, but just listen as I read it. Proverbs 12, 22, he says, Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who act faithfully are his delight. Friend, the Lord knows your heart, he knows your actions, and he knows your words. But finally, in verses 5 to 6 of this stanza, we see that the Lord knows David's whole life. In other words, your, your whole life, friend, is known by God. Nothing in your heart, actions, words, or life is hidden from him. No one, no one else may know the intentions and inclinations of your heart, but friend, God does. No one else may know where your feet have trod and what you have done behind closed doors, but God knows perfectly. No one else may know what you've uttered from your lips, but God has heard every word and he knew it, the text says, before you even spoke it. Some may know your past. More might know your present. You don't even know your future, but God knows your past, your present, and your future. Nothing is hidden from him. In other words, You cannot masquerade yourself before God. 
A while back, I heard of a man and a woman who went out to dinner at a fancy restaurant. And maybe like you, they had, they had gone not having reservations, right? We're just going to wing it. We're going to hope on a whim that there's seats for us. And they showed up to a packed restaurant with no seats. Well, while trying to figure out what to do or where to pivot to go elsewhere for dinner, the hostess calls out emphatically, uh, the Smiths, party of two. Looking around and seeing no one answer the call, the wife, who hadn't gotten reservations, quickly grabs her husband's arms and says, right here we are. The hostess says, great, follow me. And as they're walking back through a crowd of envious onlookers, also awaiting their seats, the hostess looks over her shoulder at the couple and says, I'm so glad that you're finally here. Your family has already arrived and is waiting on you. The masquerade is over. Church, we cannot masquerade ourselves before God. He sees through all the masks. He sees through the facades that we put on. And he knows a phony when he sees one. David is making it painstakingly clear in this psalm and in this stanza to us. Beloved, the omniscience of the Lord, the fact that he knows all, will be a doctrine that will either for you provide great comfort because you're in Christ or great terror and fear if you are outside of Christ. But for David, we see that the omniscience of the Lord, the fact that he knows all, actually brings him great comfort and joy. It reinforces his trust in David's God. And and, and so likewise for you and I, the omniscience of the Lord should reinforce our trust in him. Do you know that the Lord knows all? Do you know that he's fashioned and formed the, the plan far before you even drew your first breath? Far before you were formed in your mother's womb, the Lord knew. He knows perfectly about that situation in your life that you don't know how to resolve. He knows perfectly about that wayward son or that wayward daughter that you don't know if, if, if they're ever going to believe in Jesus. He knows intimately and perfectly. If you're worried about the outcome or the course of your life, what you'll do, what you'll say, what you'll do as a career, what you'll do as a job after college, a friend, the Lord knows perfectly, and this should be a comfort to you. This should be a comfort to, to all of us. We are able to trust God because he's omniscient, but we aren't only able to trust God because he's omniscient. Look at verses 7 to 12. We're able to trust God because he is omnipresent. He is everywhere. Look back at your text with me in verses 7. David writes this, and I love this bit of, of text. If you know Psalm 139, these are some verses that should be popping up to you. David says, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to the heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I, if I take the wings of the morning and, and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. Isn't that good news? The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. In verse 7, we see an example of Hebrew parallelism. In other words, David asks the same question in two different ways, and he's doing so to make it emphatically clear to us that there is no escaping, friends, the oversight of God. He is everywhere all the time, and nothing escapes him. He is, in other words, omnipresent. If you you grew up in children's church or in You know, hearing these stories of the Bible, you probably were taught about the omniscience and the omnipresence of God. He is everywhere at one time. David poetically shows us not only the depth of God's omnipresence, but also the breadth. Notice in verse 8 that we cannot escape from God in the heavens. Verse 8 says, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. In other words, you can't get a spaceship and climb to the height of the cosmos. Why? Why? Because God owns the cosmos. He's there. David essentially says, try as you may, God's dwelling is in the heavens. Notice the second half of verse 8. Well, if it's not the heavens, then I'll make my bed in Sheol. Well, he notices there that you're there as well. So if I can't escape from God in the heavens, I'll go to the opposite. I'll go to the depths of the earth. The ancient world believed that the middle of the earth was the underworld. So surely if... God's in the heavens, then I'll just go to the underworld. God isn't there. God owns that too. David says, drill as you will, as you may, all the way to the center of the earth, but you won't escape God. So notice this. We we can't escape from God on this plane. 
So David says, well, we'll try to escape from God on another plane then. If you look, at the, look at the text. Verse 9, he says, if I take the wings of the morning, quite literally translated, if I go infinitely east, think about where the sun rises. The, if I go to the, the wings of the morning where the sun rises, even there I can't escape. Or look at the second half of verse 9. If I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. For David, west was the Mediterranean. In other words, where the sun set. So, so David is essentially uh, saying, I can go all the way east or I can go all the way west, but there, even there, I can't escape from your presence. And David concludes in verse 10, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. In other words, David says, I can go to the heavens or I can go down to the depths. I can go infinitely east or I can go infinitely west, but I cannot, I will not escape the omnipresence of God. Here in a couple months, we will once again be watching NFL football and we will once again be watching the Panthers lose NFL football. Friends, God isn't like the instant replay system that might get the right angle and might get the right camera view. God sees every angle from every vantage point. His perspective is perfect. He misses nothing. And notice for David, that this text brings great comfort to him as a believer. Friend, if you're a Christian, you're reading verses 7 through 12, you should be encouraged that you will never and can never and will absolutely never escape from the presence of God. He's with you wherever you go, forever. If the Lord's with you, none can be against you, right? The Lord is with you, and David, for him, it brings comfort. But this same doctrine of God's omnipresence should also strike fear into those who are outside of Christ. Do you see that? If you're a Christian, you can reread, look there in your text, verse 7, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to the heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If you're a Christian, those are some of the most poetic promises in all of the canon. But to the unbeliever, this is terrifying news that I cannot escape the presence of God. Well, the non-believer will then say, well, if I can't escape from God in the day, then surely I'll just wait till the cover of nightfall. Look at verse 11. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. The Apostle John will write elsewhere in John 3.19. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Friends, there's something about darkness, isn't there? People think that it can conceal their evil. Uh, one stormy night in July of 1977, several lightning strikes took down the power supply of the entire city of New York. Tens of thousands of people didn't stay in their homes seeking refuge. No, they poured out into the streets of New York, all under the cover of nightfall, led by greed, roving bands of men and women shattered glass storefronts, tore down metal shutters, and took away everything they could carry. Some even stole trucks to travel with their stolen loot. Fires broke out everywhere. Police and firemen stampeded in the chaos of that night. Thieves even stole from one another. Imagine. Only a small fraction of the looters were ever, ever even caught. But over 2,000 stores were plundered and damages cost the city of New York over $1 billion, all for one night because the lights went out. But there was one eyewitness to every crime Every item stolen by every individual. David writes in verse 12, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. Friends, know that deeds done in darkness are not hidden from our God. He is the God of light. He sees all, and God will judge every lawless deed done. 
He is faithful, friends, to dispense justice while at the same time dispensing grace to his children, to those who have received him by faith. We can trust God because he is omniscient, and we can trust God because he is omnipresent, but surely we can also trust him because he is omnipotent. So he knows all, and he's everywhere at all times, but he also can do anything. Look at verses 13 to 18. David writes, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book uh, were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I could count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I'm still with you. Here in this stanza, we see the omniscience of God And the omnipresence of God wed in the most beautiful ways, in the most personal ways. God's omnipotence to create and fashion. Omniscience. God knew you. He fashioned you. He he framed you. He named you before your own birth. Uh, Omnipresence. God has been with you every step of the way from before the womb to post the tomb. The Lord was with us even before the womb, as he makes clear to Jeremiah the prophet in Jeremiah 1.5. He says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, the Lord says to Jeremiah. God isn't merely omniscient, and he isn't merely omnipresent. He is omnipotent, meaning God not only has the proficiency and the presence to do all, he has the power to do anything that he chooses and pleases to do. God powerfully formed and fashioned you, but he has done so, beloved, personally. If you in the room today are fast, it's because God made you that way. Also, if you're slow, it's because God made you that way. So now you know who to blame. If you're good at administration, God made you that way. If you're good at nurturing, God made you that way. If you excel at caring, that's God's imprint. If you're a gifted communicator, God has imprinted that on your life. Friend, think about a tree that bears fruit. You didn't grow the tree, and you didn't cultivate its fruit. God did both of those things. All you were to do is cultivate, pick the fruit that God has grown on the tree that is your life. You didn't go out and amass the giftings that you have in the same way that I didn't go out and amass the giftings that I have. God grew them on you. God cultivated them on you. We are to pick them and to glorify him with our lives. Any ability you have, God's entrusted you for his glory. And this goes without being said, but the language of this text, if you notice it, you've been queuing in. The language of this text shows us the importance of the unborn. God knows us before we are framed God knows us as we are being formed, and before we are framed and formed, he knew what our name would ultimately be. This is why David can sing in the Psalms. He says, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, verse 14 says. My soul knows it very well. Going on in verse 15, David says, My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret. Notice that text. Intricately woven in the depths of the earth. The term intricately woven here in this text is the same term that Moses uses to write about how the, the, the curtains of the tabernacle were intricately woven. Beloved, do you know that you were intricately woven and uniquely made by God? Do you know that from the time you're an embryo, all 30 trillion cells that make up your entire person are there? Do you know that your DNA sequence all of us have that's unique to us is not only a sequence that shows how your body will grow, function, and perform, but it is completely unique to you and you alone. In fact, did you know that your thumbprint is unlike anyone else's on the entire planet? Go ahead, for the sake of being silly for a second, look at your thumb. Look at the the print of your thumb. Do you know that, that your thumb's print is unlike anyone else's in the entire cosmos? Even identical twins don't have the same thumbprint. Did you know that? That's why when iPhone several years ago came out with the thumbprint, that only your thumbprint out of 7 billion people would work to open up the iPhone. And that's just 7 billion as of now. 
Do you know that some estimates say that there have been some 117 billion people that have lived and existed on this earth as God has been sovereign and ruled and reigned over this earth, and yet God has not exhausted his creative ability? He's still in the business of creativity. And David writes about this DNA information before verse or before any of it's available in verse 16. Look at verse 16. He says, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. It makes sense why David would write and conclude in verse 17 and 18, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. David essentially says, if I tried to think of all your power and all of your thoughts, I would fall asleep and have to pick up the next day thinking about you. And then I would stay up that entire day thinking about the vast sum of your thoughts and I would grow weary and I would fall asleep and I would do so in an ever-increasing, never-ending cycle of thinking of the Lord, falling asleep so weary and I wake up the next day and still yet there's more to think of. God is surely omniscient. He is undeniably omnipresent and he's creatively omnipotent. But God is much more than that. We can trust him, finally, beloved, in this text, because God is omnicompetent, meaning that he will deal with everything, and you could even add there, everyone. Now, this is one we don't talk about very often, but God is omnicompetent. We see that in verses 19 through 24. In Milwaukee, in 1991, a man named Jeffrey Dahmer is arrested for killing and mutilating 17 men and hiding their bodies in vats of acid in his apartment. Some of you are alive to remember those headlines. He's caught, convicted, and the, there's a, actually Netflix did a documentary series on his life where they trace the life and history of, of Jeffrey Dahmer. And the docuseries has, shows him being caught and convicted and confined to prison waiting for the death sentence. Apparently, uh, in Jeffrey Dahmer's timeline, supposedly he trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ while he was awaiting the death penalty in prison. And I remember just a few years ago, and this documentary was really prevalent uh, in social media, and I had people coming up to me when I was a youth pastor, and they said, Grant, there is no way that God could save someone like Jeffrey Dahmer, right? You're like, you, you're, you're not telling me that Jeffrey Dahmer occupies the same heaven that I'm going to, right? There's, there's no way that God could save a monster like that. That wouldn't happen, right, Grant? Do I know if Jeffrey Dahmer is in heaven? I can't say. But I do know this. Turn that question back around on yourselves. How can God let you be saved? How can God let me be saved? Beloved, any sin is divine treason against our creator. And God is both just in dispensing justice to those who rightly deserve it, while at the same time dispensing grace and mercy to those who have received it. That is how good our God is. That is his omnicompetence. He will deal rightly with everything and everyone always. So do you worry about mass murderers who supposedly trust in Jesus Christ the same way that you might lie awake in your own bed at night and wonder, am I truly saved? Do I know the Lord Jesus Christ? Am I going to go to heaven? Friends, God is perfectly just. He isn't like these judges that we see on TV that might make the right call or might make the right uh, decision. No, God perfectly executes justice 100 times out of 100. Never will he allow anyone into heaven that doesn't rightly deserve it, and no one deserves it. We only deserve it for one reason, because of the spilt blood and broken body of Jesus Christ. But he will also send all of those who have rejected Jesus and spurned and hated Jesus to hell. He will deal rightly with everyone always. Friends, the reason God can dispense grace to those who sinned against him is because he also dispensed wrath on his son Jesus Christ. Friends, Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. He never sinned. For all the years that he was alive on this earth, he was fully God, fully man, and never sinned. And even though he had never sinned, he went to this cross. Look at the three crosses that are on this pulpit. He went to the cross of Golgotha, 
and he hung his broken body, his spilt blood, and he died, and he took away the debt of sin that was owed for you and I, and he died with it. But that's not the good news, for any man can die on a tree. Jesus Christ died, but he didn't stay dead. On the third day, he rose with all power and glory and might, and he shows us that by his resurrection power, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, you and I can trust in for our salvation and the righteousness that Jesus Christ now has is given. It's imputed to you and I so that when God looks at you and I who are in Christ Jesus, he can say to us, that is someone covered by the blood and the broken body of my son Jesus. So, so why can you go to heaven? It's not because you deserve it. It's not because you sat here at Northside Baptist for 60 years. It's not because of any of those reasons. It is because of the spilt blood and the broken body of Jesus Christ. It's because of the empty tomb that you've trusted by faith in Jesus and you're saved. That's the gospel. God can save you because he poured out his wrath on his son. God is omnicompetent. He is always faithful to deal and disperse justice to not just his enemies, but his children. But know this, friends, that those who reject Jesus Christ will not do so forever. For a time is coming where every deed will be judged. Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. No one will come to the Father apart from him. Lay aside the wide path of destruction and cling to the narrow path of life. That's how we become saved. Look at how David pens it in verses 19 to 22. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Just as we can trust that God will deal rightly and righteously with his enemies, friends, notice in this text that God will also deal rightly and righteously with his children. Look at verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God. David now talks as one who is in, uh, uh, has believed in God. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there's any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Beloved, God is omnicompetent. He has never not dealt rightly and righteously with anyone, enemies or his own children. We can trust in that this morning. That's what the psalmist is calling us upon. This stanza shows us that he will be just in condemning his enemies to hell in the same way that he is just in forgiving and cleansing sinners by the spilt blood of Jesus Christ. The question that remains this morning as I wrap up and I close is what side of the fence are you on? Have you trusted in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus? Are you no longer an enemy? Are you a friend? Are you no longer a slave, but you're free? Are you no longer an orphan, but you're now a child? Or have you continued to reject the gospel? For all who reject the gospel will not be saved. But if you, to this morning, can trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, God will deal omnicompetently with you. He will save you from this wrath. I just noticed there in verses 23 and 24, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. When was the last time that we prayed that prayer? Lord, search me. Know my thoughts. Try me. Know my heart. I almost think of like a, a sifter. I think of like gold, right? God, sift out all the stuff in me that isn't precious gold. I don't want it there. You don't want it there. I want to look like you. I want to be precious. I want to, I want to be found faithful. See if there's any grievous way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. Beloved, God is omniscient. He knows all. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere. He is omnipotent. He can do anything. And finally, he is omnicompetent. He will deal rightly with everything and everyone. How will he deal with you this morning? How will he deal with you? Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, that we know the omni-God, one who is perfect in knowledge, 
perfect in presence, perfect in power, perfect in dispensing just and mercy rightly to his enemies and his children. Father, would you help us when we think about Psalm 139, Lord, to see ourselves rightly before you. God, we are not those who deserve salvation. We are those who are deserving of wrath and punishment, and yet you in your kindness, God, have given us a way, one way, one truth, one life, in the work of Jesus Christ, your son. Father, I pray for us at Northside Baptist, those of us at Park Baptist, those of us who live in Rock Hill, those who are in South Carolina and United States and this country and this world, and this, all the inhabitants, Lord, that we would be found faithful. We would trust you, Jesus, what you've done for us on the cross and the empty tomb. God, I pray that we would leave here trusting you more and more. Lord, for these doctrines, as sweet as they are to Christians, are utterly terrifying to the unbeliever. So, Lord, help us to trust in you, Jesus, to trust in what you've done for us on the cross and the empty tomb, that we might be those who rejoice in these great doctrines, that we might revel in them and bask in them and thank you, God, daily for them. Father, we love you. Thank you for who you are, what you've done for us in Christ. We pray all this in Jesus' name. And everybody in the room said, amen.